But it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Bahar Fuchs, uh, who's a tremendous colleague. And, and you're going to hear some of what is actually his brainchild with Cogtail, which is really addressing some methodologic limitations in the field and providing it a centralized resource. Um, so I'm sure you'll hear a bit about that, as well as how you can use this to do some analyses. Um, welcome. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction and for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here in Ann Arbor for the second time in, in a few years. And I have to say, last time I was here was uh, July, so it was beautiful in summer, and this is a bit different. I think next time I'm going to come back in, in July. Uh, my, slideshow, my slides were doing the same thing last night on my computer, so there's something going on with my slides, but nonetheless. Um, so I'd like to share with you a little bit of work that uh, we're doing to synthesize some of the evidence for uh, memory-oriented cognitive training in people with MCI using this really cool platform that Ben mentioned that we've built together called uh, Cogtail. Uh, I've got no financial conflicts of interest. I'm the principal. Oh, it's doing it again. I'm the principal investigator on the co uh, Cocktail platform, um, and these are my sources of support. I'd like to particularly mention the RPC and BI, which has been supporting this work as well. So I'm sure I don't need to convince any of you here about um, the importance of work directed at prevention of dementia. And I didn't choose to put the jacket al uh, figure, <laughs> but I did choose to put the uh, figure from the Lancet Dementia Commission report by Jill Livingstone from 2020, which has been shown numerous times, uh, and shows you the uh, range of um, risk factors throughout the life course uh, and the respective reduction in dementia prevalence that we could see if we eliminated uh, any on, or all of these uh, risk factors. And um, as much as uh, prevention efforts go, particularly when it comes to non-pharmacological treatments, uh, we now focus on primary and depending on whether you take a more biological disease definition or a, a clinical one, uh, secondary and tertiary prevention of uh, dementia. As far as non-pharmacological interventions go, uh, they have been defined uh, by uh, our colleague Javier Olazaran a few years ago as any theoretically based non-chemical um, focused and replicable intervention uh, conducted with a patient or a caregiver with potentially providing some relevant benefits. And as most of you would be well aware, these are a range of diverse, generally well-tolerated interventions with clear advantages, uh, typically very uh, minimal adverse uh, side effects. Unfortunately, they're also often not particularly well uh, sort of theoretically informed or based. And if any of you wants to sort of um, learn a little bit more about this, I encourage you to take a look at a perspective a theoretical paper we published a few years ago in Alzheimer's and Dementia, uh, in which we use the re rehabilitation treatment specification system to specify a range of non-pharmacological treatment approaches and also provided some methodological guidelines for trial design. Jumping to cognitive interventions, uh, in the context of dementia prevention, uh, the Australian Dementia Management Guidelines for uh, GPs, which published in 2016, uh, recommended that um, people should basically be engaging in social and cognitive uh, activities. But any clinician here in the audience uh, would appreciate most GPs and in that many other clinicians don't really know what to offer uh, patients uh, coming to our clinics or provide sort of more specific recommendations. So. Uh, ben and others have already provided the relevant definitions. I'm going to try and go through this really quickly. Um, really, in the field, we've been distinguishing between cognitive stimulation, rehabilitation, and training over the last uh, 20 years or so since Linda Clare uh, published. Something is really strange with these slides. I'm not touching anything, and they're going by themselves. <laughs> um, let me go back. Uh, so since Linda Clare uh, published the 2003-2004 Cochrane Review, uh, we've make, been making this distinction. And um, my colleague Lauren Mozowski uh, from the University of Sydney, in her review from 2010, classified all of these under the umbrella term cognitive remediation. Uh, since 2013, I've been using the term cognition-oriented treatment. So nice to see that others have been using this, uh, this term as well. Um, I have to say, to say we continue to have a lot of different terms used in the field to, to refer to these interventions, which 
uh, doesn't really help things. And I must say that I, even myself, am not particularly satisfied anymore with the uh, term cognition-oriented treatments, but that's a discussion maybe for another time. Um, very quickly, as we said, cognitive stimulation therapy, which is not really the focus of today, tends to be applied in group settings for people with more advanced uh, dementia. It's a structural, it's a structured approach developed by Emmy Spector, Bob Woods, and their colleagues in the UK, and really it follows a 14-session uh, program. Uh, cognitive rehabilitation, which I'm sure Linda Clare will talk about much more today, is a much more uh, functionally oriented approach, highly individualized, focus on optimizing opportunity for independent participation in personally meaningful everyday tasks while building on uh, existing strengths and residual abilities uh, while trying to minimize so-called excess disability. It's always delivered within a, an enablement uh, framework and is highly person-centered, focuses on goal uh, setting and uh, most importantly maybe assumes minimal transfer will occur. So really the, 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 the training itself or the intervention is direct is done within the relevant tasks and context of everyday activities. Um, it revolves around the close collaboration between the person with dementia, the therapist, a, a care partner, uh, which are all key for success, it involves a, a very detailed problem analysis, barrier identification and removal, and then the implementation of a range of internal and external strategies. Now, finally, cognitive training, probably better known, uh, the better known uh, technique or broad approach from the three that I've described, probably also the most researched, uh, involves these key features. Uh, it usually involves the, the repeated practice on relatively standardized and well-defined cognitive tasks. It does tend to assume that gains in performance will transfer beyond the immediate context of the training, often because we're presuming, presumably training a skill or an underlying ability. And ideally, tasks should really uh, sort of, task demands should vary with, with performance. Now, Lauren Mozalski, uh, from Sydney, again, she drew a distinction, it's a bit hard to see, uh, between, um, uh, I even can't see it, between um, uh, so-called strategy-based and computerized approaches uh, in her 2010 review. And as Ben already mentioned before, in his 2013 uh, 14 review, he drew a distinction between rehearsal-based approaches and compensatory approaches, which in turn he divided into external aids and internal aids. Now, this just shows an example of how in the field we've been debating sort of the best way to classify interventions. And while these have generally been very helpful um, uh, sort of taxonomies, um, we can still sort of debate the extent to which we still rely on a more theoretically coherent framework to uh, describe our interventions. Anyway, most of you will be aware that there's a plethora of commercially available uh, cognitive training programs. Here's just a small sample of them. Uh, most of them don't particularly or specifically target memory, uh, but are more sort of multi-domain type applications. And I'm uh, not here to endorse any of these particular companies, but some of them, some have been subjected to scientific investigation more than more than others. And you probably know that the industry as a whole got into trouble more than once for kind of misleading uh, claims. I've, I've included a couple of uh, references there for uh, meta-analytic studies that specifically focused on the effects associated with uh, commercially available computerized cognitive training programs. There are, um, uh, in addition to those, several labs and research groups that uh, develop and scientifically evaluate um, uh, freely available perceptual and cognitive training programs. For example, the, uh, the group at the Brain Game Center at the University of California at Riverside, which I think develops some really fantastic uh, tools that are available freely. Just a typical example of one of the commercially available training platforms of a task that trains sort of visual working memory where a person needs to sort of recall an increasing number of uh, lilies in a particular order on a screen and as they get better with their performance the number of lilies to recall uh, increases or here's another task in which a person needs to recall uh, certain melodies that they hear and match their location uh, on, on the screen. Uh, ben and Sylvia already discussed the kind of more strategy-based approach to cognitive training, which typically is delivered in scientific laboratories, uh, including Ben and Sylvia and others, and involves a more kind of metacognitive element uh, to this training, 
And here are a couple of uh, examples that Ben and Sylvie already referred to. In the case of Ben, the uh, mnemonic strategy training, including visual imagery. And in the case of Sylvie's work, the uh, attention-focused variable priority training targeting dual task performance. And then finally, a third class of interventions that are often referred to as cognitive training as well, but in my mind, they're a bit sort of hybrid in terms of like the, the key features of cognitive training. These are the group-based approaches that combine psychoeducational content with strategy, instruction, and practice, uh, often focused on memory. So in Australia, I've got a couple of examples here. We have the, um, the LATCH program developed by Glinda Kinsella at La Trobe University, or the Healthy Brain Aging program developed by Sharon A. Smith at Sydney University, and of course, Sylvie's Memo Plus uh, program, which you already described. Now, in terms of the evidence for all of this, as you know, I've been involved a little bit in this, and in contrast to our earlier version of the Cochrane Review from 2013, in the most recent version of the Cochrane Review from 2019, we found clear evidence um, from 33, 33 studies of moderate effects of uh, cognitive training on global cognition for people with mild to moderate dementia. Unfortunately, the other two Cochrane reviews uh, led by Nicola Gates from the University of Sydney um, focused on people with MCI and healthy older adults did not find any effects of computerized cognitive training on global cognition in people with, uh, as I said, MCI and cognitively unimpaired. However, these reviews were later uh, found to have some significant design and conceptual flaws in them, and um, I think uh, led to the inclusion of a very small number of studies in them. Uh, we led a few years ago a so-called systematic overview, which is a, a higher level of evidence synthesis uh, and quickly becoming the most authoritative type of evidence synthesis in which um, the studies that you include are themselves systematic reviews. And my postdoc, uh, Mo, uh, Hannah Molberg gavelin uh, reviewed no less than 46 meta-analytic studies of cognition-oriented treatments across the aging spectrum and found pretty clear evidence um, that cognitive training was effective for cognition in people with MCI uh, with the most uh, authoritative and rigorous review uh, really being led by uh, my colleague Amit Lampit and Nicole Hill in 2017. Some of you may know this review. It's very highly cited uh, and received the highest AMSTAR score. So AMSTAR is a, is a scale rating methodological quality of systematic reviews. Uh, they found in their review that, uh, that um, computerized cognitive training for people with MCI was associated with gains in global uh, cognition. That's kind of a small to moderate effect size they also found effects in a number of domains of cognition, including in uh, working memory, verbal learning, uh, and verbal memory, uh, as well as nonverbal uh, learning. So it was a pretty uh, authoritative evidence in support of computerized cognitive training. However, this review didn't specifically look at more kind of memory oriented interventions. It focused on computerized cognitive training, typically um, sort of multi-domain trainings. And we, we sort of didn't really know from this, although they did do a number of kind of subgroup analysis. And some experience in Sarah. Normally, this is a very rapidly evolving uh, field with contemporary forms of evidence synthesis becoming uh, increasingly complex and consider the forms of original research with, with sort of more impressive methodologies. It's also a very time consuming uh, exercise that typically requires a team of people working together, uh, often for more than two or three years. Uh, that's what it took us to run the Cochrane Review. And all, all of this time, new primary research gets keeps getting published at sort of ever increasing speeds. So you always feel like you're already out of date by the time you publish your, your, your review. So partly to address this and other challenges uh, in our field, we developed the, the cocktail platform, which includes uh, a number of cool innovative features that um, help us accelerate the evaluation, synthesis, and dissemination 
of evidence. Now, I'm not going to be able to give you a, a, an overview of the chance of getting in touch with you want to find out more. And we also are currently about to start recruiting for our second intake of an internship program. So you might want to share with other students about this. Uh, I will have a quick background. Uh, we formed this cider group nearly 10 years ago, 2014, I believe, in Copenhagen with Sylvie Ben, Sharon, Sleep Volaski, and since then we had quite a few other collaborators and we've been doing a bunch of different fun sort of things together over the years. One of them was we want to develop a, a, a tool to capture methodological and results data from cognition or treatment studies. We applied for a small grant from Dementia Australia and lo and behold, we got it. And we were able to, to develop the cocktail platform. The main objectives of this was to establish the comprehensive repository of uh, cognition oriented treatment trials in older adults. Uh, where we will be continuously extract and maintain a large number of design and methodological elements from these studies uh, and assess, assess their, um, their association with efficacy. Also, research, uh, reduce research waste, accelerate, as I said, the evidence synthesis pi uh, pipeline, and generate evidence summaries in non technical language. And you see just a, a sample of some of the features that we have or are currently in stages of developing mm -hmm. for the corporate platform, targeting researchers, clinicians, and um, the general public. So, as I said, I'm not going to be able to cover them uh, today in any great depth, but please do uh, take a look and reach out if you want to find out a little bit more. In brief, uh, as either researchers or other sort of uh, interested users, you can conduct uh, different types of search for uh, literature that is stored on the cocktail platform using either simple browsing or you can uh, search by, by author name or by uh, filtering by such things as the year and the trial quality. Uh, but we also added over 50 additional variables that you can uh, filter your searching. So if you wanted to search for articles that use a specific training program or whether goal setting was used or Lots of other sort of cool design features, you can do that by our sort of advanced search on the platform. Uh, when you look at a particular study, uh, in this case with Ben's uh, recent study toward rational use of cognitive training, uh, once we extract all the data from the study, the platform automatically calculates the three methodological quality scores, and you may have heard of them, the Pedro scale, Jaded scale, and uh, Cochrane risk of bias scores. All of them get computed automatically by the algorithms that we've developed. Um, you can see the ben, uh, this is for the six out of ten, which is a recent trial, which is pretty good. Ben, don't worry, there's not as much as in that. I don't want to talk to you about that. We will talk about that. <laughs> it may not be perfect, but it's still better than a human, different humans making constant mistakes. At least it's going to be consistent. Um, and then, of course, we also produce automatically all the effect sizes that can be generated from the study based on the means and standard deviations, including, uh, uh, as I said, the, all the measures are listed, the effect sizes and who they favor in the different timings. Uh, so anyway, we wanted to have a, a bit of a look um, at uh, the kind of literature on memory-oriented memory cognitive training in MCI. These are the, the sort of kickoff criteria here. We wanted to uh, focus on people with MCI without any, of any subtype. Um, we searched the literature for cognitive training studies that had a kind of more memory oriented uh, focus, and they could have any control group and any outcome as long as they really uh, included at least one cognitive outcome and uh, at least two time points. We excluded from this search uh, studies that had. Uh, Either mixed populations without reporting the results separately for people with MCI, uh, as well as cognitively unimpaired people with dementia or We also excluded studies that had multi domain cognitive training, multi component interventions, uh, concurrent treatments, as well as CST and cognitive regression. This just shows you the flow, and this I have to acknowledge my, my two RAs, Courtney Chester and Ian Millington, who have worked really a uh, uh, lot of time in the last few weeks to identify, find, extract the data from all the studies. Because unlike a typical systematic review or meta analysis, we actually extract a huge amount of data in the cocktail. So 
uh, it's not just the several questions that you want to tackle, you can tackle, probably extract more than 100 variables for a study. Um, you can see the results of the search there. We ended up with uh, 24 papers that were included in the uh, systematic review and were basically imported into a cocktail and extracted. You won't be able to see anything there, but these are the general characteristics of the, of the 24 studies. I'll summarize them for you. The ones in red, by the way, uh, are also the reasons could not be included in the analysis because they didn't provide us with data in the form that we could work with. They included uh, one of your studies, Sharon, <laughs> um, and uh, three other studies. Uh, the 24 studies were conducted between 20, uh, 2006 and 2022 in the range of countries, as you can see there. Uh, the Pedro scores ranged from 3 to 8. In another separate analysis we found, we've shown, by the way, a slight improvement in uh, the Pedro scores over the years that we've been um, capturing data, which is a good sign of the methodological standards. Of we call it the city approaches that we found here as basically being either strategy use uh, any uh, 17 studies uh, using uh, mnemonic uh, strategy training either one by itself or more typically several so there were eight of those uh, studies that looked at errorless learnings space retrieval or repetition lag uh, there were four of those um, studies that combined MST with, with some of those learning strategies. Um, and uh, we had one study that used external support, uh, namely calendar use, uh, and then a few studies that were memory oriented but were just like rehearsal based studies. Uh, 16 of those were individually delivered, and uh, eight of those were delivered in groups. Now, the cocktail platform, after you do the meta analysis research, uh, you take a look at basically produces a report you can send to your email. All the analysis are done on the fly, it just gets to you, sent to your email. Uh, it's a very lengthy report, it's 40, 50 pages, so uh, we divided it into like a summary section and then a more detailed section. You typically see um, like uh, some general information about, you see some general information about uh, uh, cognition or improvement, some educational information, then some disclaimers, and then the search results, which will tell you something about what you looked for, how many studies were found to be eligible. In this case, it tells you that um, 11 real outcomes and seven specific outcomes were evaluated by at least three studies, which is what our system requires in order to pull the data. Um, and then we were able to calculate effect sizes for those studies. So uh, you can see that in this case, from the 24 studies that were included, we were able to essentially include 18 outcomes that we could pull. And when I say broad and specific, the way we work with the cocktail is that for each outcome measure that we extract, we classify it both ways. One is a broad at a broad level, say memory or auditory verbal memory. And a specific level might be auditory verbal memory, free recall, something like that. So we try to sort of create those two levels of outcome specific. Um, then the report sort of goes into this overall summary and then provides you with some general information that is then produced into a one, one sort of forest plot type figure on the right. And that gives you all the broad outcomes, not the specific outcomes, but all the broad outcomes are summarized there um, in terms of effect sizes favoring the control or the intervention group. The colors that you see, the, the red and the uh, amber, orange, uh, re reflect sort of the quality scores. Uh, another cool thing we developed into the cocktail platform is that we take a number of parameters, including uh, the treatment effect, the heterogeneity, risk of bias, and so on, and we calculate automatically our confidence in the findings. It's a little bit similar to the uh, grading approach that we use in Cochrane, but just a little bit less rigorous. Um, but basically, it means that for every effect estimate that we have, we also have confidence in the finding. Um, and as you can see here, um, we have uh, a field that we have moderate confidence for, with the majority being low confidence. Okay. So I'm running out of time. Um, let's see. Um, here is an example of the, the, the first table that, uh, in the first analysis, we looked at all the 24 studies. 
And you can see that uh, looking at the broad outcome here, memory and mixed memory, kind of visual and for your verbal, um, we have a, a small and significant effect size uh, with, uh, with uh, moderate quality. You can see that up there, uh, memory is quite a small uh, confidence interval. Um, and it's under, so we have moderate confidence in that uh, taking all the studies together, we have. Um, a small effect size on on memory. And when we look specifically at um, uh, what is this? This is the auditory verbal memory. You can see that the effect is even is even larger there. It's 0.58. Um, and again, the confidence in the that finding is small. When we look at um, uh, specific outcomes, for example, in this case, auditory verbal uh, free recall immediate. That's an example of where. Despite the fact that all three studies that are included there were uh, found to have positive effect sizes or effect sizes favoring the intervention, when we pulled it, uh, with the effects together, they were not significant. And also, the confidence in that finding as well. So, basically, the, the, the rest of the report sort of takes you through all these outcomes in this way. It's very, very detailed. I'm just showing you here that for uh, visual spatial memory. Uh, we had uh, similarly and uh, suggesting that there is a uh, moderate effect for visual spatial uh, memory there, but the quality of the evidence for that was considered low. Um, and as we move on to uh, working memory on the bottom, you can see again that we've got both for general working memory as well as, well as for actually verbal working memory. Uh, the findings suggest. Uh, small to moderate effect, but of uh, low confidence. Now, low confidence in the finding, by the way, don't get too blocked by that. That's kind of the standard. In most of the reviews, by default, we have confidence because it's very easy to lose points for a, a range of reasons. So, it's not unusual to have low confidence in the finding. So, what this actually means in practical terms is that the accumulation of additional evidence is quite likely to lead to a change in our estimate. Whereas when we have a moderate confidence in the finding, it means that we believe that the addition of more studies is unlikely to lead to very kind of big differences in our estimate. Uh, then the report gives you a little bit of a, of a kind of a verbal summary like that, where we basically say, based on, for example, auditory verbal memory, eight studies with such such participants, the effects of the intervention on this outcome, the auditory verbal. Uh, memory is moderate in significant significance, and our certainty in accuracy is moderate. Then we can follow with a with a recommendation, which is also based on some uh, language templates we developed, which we say at this time a modest recommendation in support of um, uh, benefits of this treatment um, in relation to specific indication can be made. So again, we, we tailor the recommendation that we uh, that we make for each outcome based on our confidence in the outcome, the size of the effect. So, uh, in the two minutes of that left, I was just telling you that we repeated the analysis using the uh, studies that uh, were using any form of strategy. Okay, 17 studies that used any form of strategy. And here again, we see that the uh, outcome of memory, generally speaking, uh, remains as significant as well as the uh, auditory verbal one, although of a lower quality, uh, as well as uh, the working memory outcome. But when we looked at the eight studies here that we're, we're sort of focusing on uh, mnemonic strategy training uh, specifically, uh, only a small number of outcomes, mainly five broad outcomes, specific outcomes could be evaluated or pulled in terms of effect size, and all of them were found to be non significant here. And also, the quality of the evidence was too low to, um, to have confidence. This then might not be the news you want to hear, but we can talk a little bit later about why this happened and how we can. Let's look at the, the confidence interval. So barely crossing zero. <laughs> okay, so this kind of just shows you a little bit the capabilities of the, of the system, and this is just kind of working progress. We're still we're still kind of learning on how to how to do this more effectively, and we, we are uh, continuing all the time to extract more studies into the cloud. What we did find is that uh, we were able to to uh, we look at effect estimates for 11 broad and seven specific outcomes for these kind of memory oriented studies. 
Um, uh, as is often being reported in the literature, functional outcomes are typically not reported. Maybe this just reflects the fact these are MCI participants, but regardless, we don't really see enough kind of everyday uh, functioning outcomes in these types of studies. There's clear evidence that uh, memory oriented cognitive training in general and those that use the strategy, uh, any strategy in particular, are associated with gains in, measure, in measures of memory and working memory. Uh, I should emphasize this is immediately following the intervention. Uh, we see some train, trends towards gain in subjective cognition and in global cognition. I didn't really talk about that because of all the trends, but the quality of evidence is considered low. At this point, we didn't find any support for MSC based cognitive training in relation to the outcomes we evaluated, but there were very few studies uh, and the quality of the evidence was low. Uh, and we also didn't make the distinction that I think was pointed out here between sort of early and late MCI. This is the kind of stuff that once we have more studies in the system, uh, Cocktail has the capability of looking into those uh, nuance um, features very well. But we need more, more data. Um, okay, I think I'll just stop here by acknowledging the many different people that are part of this, uh, this and other projects that, that I'm working on. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'm aware that I've been between you and the lunch, so uh, I finished kind of the time. Uh, and I'm hoping to see some of you in San Diego in a few days. It will be sunnier than this. And I'm going to get a, a workshop there on cognitive interventions as well. So I'm going to see some of you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. This is very interesting work. Um, maybe I missed it, but can you uh, explain how the studies go into a cocktail? Is it something the researchers do, or I, in the ideal world that you would want researchers to do, or does it work in an automatic way? So, um, let's see if I put it there. I have a vision. It's not um, this vision involves machine learning and NLP okay, to kind of extract. We kind of submitted a grant for this, namely. I was talking to some people in the University of Melbourne that are doing some automatic uh, sort of NLP based methods because currently it's very time uh, intensive at the moment. So we have research assistants that I guess can continuously extract data. We can spend a couple of hours. On the study just to extract all the data from it. And some studies that have multiple outcome measures, multiple time points, and so on can take a long time to extract data from. So uh, I'm really hopeful that in the next iteration we'll be able to incorporate some machine learning based stuff. Once we do it, all the data is in the system and it can be used and reused and reused because we've got a very, very large amount of variables. Thank you. Okay, I have a two part question from online. If someone feels that follow, following errorless learning in day to day life activities means they are losing the persona, which is frustrating, then what to do? I'm not sure that question was specifically directed to me. Um, can you repeat again if a person feels that they are that yep that following errorless learning in day-to-day -day life activities means they are losing the persona, which is frustrating, then what to do? To me, it sounds that if a person gets to the point where they are not benefiting from errorless learning, maybe if they're on well and quite good at job. Mission, then maybe we need to sort of look into the use of more external strategies and trying to sort of frustrate them with the learning innovations and strategies that are more difficult for them. I have to say that my own personal clinical experience, I do this with, with a couple of my clients, and when I see that they are sort of getting to the point where their the severity of their dementia is a little bit more advanced, then I, I also tend to sort of stop trying so hard with the uh, early learning slash space script level. Thank you. Um, next part um, is technology based life, such as always using Google Maps, 
a barrier for engaging MCI patients in cognitive stimulation therapy? Sure, I'm quite close on. Um, technology is, you know, is a, is a blessing and a curse. Right? It's all about kind of how, how, and when we use it. So I guess um, we, well, there's many people here that can probably provide a more, more informed answer than me. But uh, I think that um, when it comes to uh, the use of technology, it's about striking that right balance between giving the person enough sense that they've got the support they need while they have enough uh, autonomy and agency. It's not like it's, so really, it's a, it's a highly individualized work. When you work with patients, you try and kind of find that sweet spot where you uh, want to make sure that technology is there to assist them, but not to place such that you still want to give them the feeling that they can, they can learn, they can benefit, they can actually apply their knowledge to, to retain that. I, would like <laughs> <laughs> I do as well. <laughs> Thank you.